Hi, for those of you that have just joined, we're just going to wait a few more seconds for the last few attendees to join and then we'll kick off this uh, PGC Worldwide Lab meeting. Okay, welcome everyone uh, to uh, this month's PGC Worldwide Lab Meeting. Uh, Patrick Sullivan sends his apologies and I said I'd step in to uh, host this uh, meeting in his absence. Um, uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Catherine Lewis and with Pat I co-chair the MDD group um, uh, of the PGC I took over a few months ago. Um, and, and it's really appropriate, I think, that I'm here this afternoon because we're delighted to welcome Dr. Eric Nessler to talk um, on the recent that he does in MDD. So for those of you that don't know Eric, um, he's director of the Friedman Brain Institute um, at Mount Sinai um, and he has not one but three posts across pharmacological sciences, neuroscience and psychiatry which makes him a brilliant match for everything that the PGC is interested in. Um, and in particular his work in neuropsychopharmacology uses animal models to understand the molecular basis of depression and drug addiction. Um, and you'll have seen from his abstract, you know, exactly how clear he lays out his work. And I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing all the details. Um, so um, with that, I'll hand over to you, uh, Eric. The floor is yours. Thanks very much, Catherine. And thanks to those of you who have joined us. Um, I'll tell you today about some of the work that we do in the area of depression looking specifically at mechanisms of transcriptional regulation. I'll begin with a very brief overview, and I know that this is redundant for most of you, but it's impossible to overstate the impact that depression has worldwide. It's listed as the top cause of disability by the World Health Organization. But despite that impact, we still know relatively little about what causes depression. Uh, you all, thanks to you all, we know that the risk for depression is highly heritable, although not as heritable as many other psychiatric syndromes, particularly schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And it's only been very recently with the study of extremely large cohorts that it's been possible to begin to find some of the specific genes that comprise that risk. Um, at the same time, we've known for decades that chronic stress is implicated in uh, causing depression or increasing the risk for depression in some people, but not in others. And the way we view depression now, like all psychiatric syndromes, is that it is a highly heterogeneous uh, collection of probably many illnesses with distinct etiologies and pathophysiologies. Now, despite that, we do have some effective treatments for depression, the antidepressant medications and some psychotherapies for mild forms of the illness. But it's, a, it's a sobering to uh, recognize for ourselves that all of these available treatments were discovered by serendipity over six decades ago now. All of today's antidepressants have the exact same mechanism of action as those older medications. And we know from the STAR-D study in large cohorts of individuals that only about half of all patients show complete remission. So there's an enormous unmet need. We also know <coughs> that uh, depression is not localized in a single brain region. Rather, many brain areas have been implicated. These are so-called limbic circuits of brain. Uh, this has been verified in recent years with brain imaging approaches. And again, just by way of review, very quickly, uh, this is a cartoon of the sagittal or sideways section of the human brain identifying some of these regions, broad regions of prefrontal cortex, a brain area that my lab has studied a lot called the nucleus accumbens, which is an, a reward center in brain, in the temporal lobe, the amygdala and hippocampus, and many other regions like the hypothalamus and the brain's monoaminergic uh, brainstem nuclei. Um, the VTA provides dopamine innervation of all of these other four brain regions, and the dorsal raphe and locus ceruleus provide innervation of norepinephrine and serotonin of these four brain regions, and presumably it's that innervation that gives today's antidepressants their mechanism of action because all of these available drugs work 
uh, through the norepinephrine or serotonin systems. So with that by way of a, of a very brief overview, my lab has been interested in, in using animal models to better understand the uh, molecular basis of depression. Uh, and uh, I think this is where we have a particularly unique challenge uh, in psychiatry. How do we model in an animal uh, a syndrome as complex as depression where the only way to diagnose the illness in humans still today, 2017, no objective laboratory-based tests, no genetic tests, brain scans, blood tests that help assist with diagnosis. It's all based on describing behaviors, many of which are simply inaccessible in animals. And I think this is one of the reasons why progress in psychiatry has lagged behind that in many other fields of medicine. Um, and, and that's something that we as a field uh, have to uh, grapple with. However, if I didn't think animal models were possible, I'd stop now. That would be the end of my uh, talk. I do think animal models can be very useful, but they need to be used judiciously. So the first animal model that I'll describe, it, we call social defeat. And this was introduced in the lab by Olivier Breton, who's now at NIDA, and Nadia Tsankova, who's here with us at Mount Sinai. And what Nadia and Olivier did was to adapt a resident intruder model in mice by taking a genetically inbred C57 mouse, putting it in the cage of a much larger, more aggressive CD1 retired breeder mouse. Fighting ensues instantaneously. It's very, very aggressive. Um, but we limit the physical encounter to a few minutes to limit physical injury. And then house the two mice across the screen where there's no more physical contact but full sensory contact. And the test mouse is therefore subjected to the aggressive cues of that larger mouse for the rest of the day. And typically, we repeat that process every day for 10 days. Every day, that same test mouse is exposed to a different aggressor mouse uh, in this manner. And at the end of that 10-day period, we have induced a behavioral syndrome, which we call social defeat, in a genetically normal C57 mouse. So this would be the equivalent of my mouse diagnostic statistical manual of diagnosing social defeat. The mice show profound anhedonia, reduced interest in pleasurable activities, and I actually think that's something that we could model pretty effectively in a, in a rodent. The mice show decreased interest in drinking sugar water, having sex, eating high-fat food, running on an exercise wheel, and so on. We describe the animals as exhibiting an increase in anxiety-like behavior, but actually, how could we ever know if a mouse is anxious or not? All anxiety-based tests in rodents are simply looking at exploratory behavior. After social defeat, these animals are less exploratory. The animals exhibit a hyperactivity of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, increased glucocorticoid secretion in response to various stimuli, disrupted circadian rhythms. This is something we've documented by showing disruption of normal temperature uh, fluctuations during the day in these animals. There's increased addiction liability. The animals exposed to social defeat are at greater risk for addicting themselves to drugs of abuse. There's an interesting metabolic syndrome. So even though the animals seem to enjoy eating less, they actually eat more and become obese and induce a pre-diabetic state of central insulin and leptin resistance. We think that's interesting because it may capture some of the comorbidity between depression and obesity that's seen in, a, in, in humans, uh, in, in a subset of individuals. And there's a profound social avoidance, which we also see uh, in these animals. Now, we've been particularly interested in social defeat because it offers several advantages over other stress paradigms in rodents. First, only about two thirds of C57 mice exhibit the range of symptoms that I described in the previous slide, and we refer to those animals as susceptible. The remainder of the animals avoid the depression-related abnormalities, but still exhibit the same changes in exploratory behavior. We call them resilient. Also, very importantly, unlike most chronic stress paradigms in rodents, where once you alleviate the stress, the animals adapt to normal function within a few days, these, these effects of social defeat in the susceptible animals are essentially lifelong. And that makes it possible for us to look at the reversal, the treatment of these abnormalities with medications or other approaches. And in fact, these uh, depression 
related abnormalities in seen in susceptible mice are reversed by the same range of antidepressants that are used to treat depression in humans. Interestingly, anxiolytic drugs like benzodiazepines are without effect. So with that as, a, as the behavioral context, my laboratory has been interested over the years in understanding how it is that behavioral experience in life can produce permanent behavioral changes in, in an individual. Uh, and uh, for that, we've looked increasingly at transcriptional and epigenetic mechanisms, which are illustrated in this slide. So here I'm showing the DNA double helix. We know that a mammalian organism, as you guys know, have about 3 billion nucleotides. Uh, we've learned a lot about how that 3 billion nucleotides, which if stretched out linearly is about 2 meters in length, can fit within a microscopic cell nucleus. The DNA is wrapped around octomers of histone proteins to form the unit of chromatin called a nucleosome. The nucleosomes are then further compacted in the most compacted state, appearing as what we see as a chromosome. This is important functionally because sections of DNA that are present in relatively uh, in spans of chromatin where the nucleosomes are spread further apart, that DNA can be active, it can serve a biological function, whereas DNA that's in these compressed regions of chromatin are inactive. They're, they're simply too constricted to provide a biological function. And for that reason, studies at the chromatin level make it possible for us uh, to use this information to help us understand uh, those genes that are affected by stress, very importantly, to look at mechanisms of that regulation. By analogy with the chromatin, uh, with the cancer biology and developmental biology fields, where certain types of these chromatin changes, also called epigenetic changes, once they occur are permanent, perhaps our hypothesis is that behavioral experience can also cause some permanent epigenetic changes in specific cells in the brain, leading to permanent behavioral abnormalities. And the hope is that this would lead to some improvement in treatment. So now just let me just say a little bit more about these epigenetic modifications, focusing at that level of analysis. Now the DNA are these gold stripes wrapped around the histone octomers, these spheres, showing the two ends of the spectrum of chromatin open active or condensed inactive. Uh, genes are activated when proteins called transcription factors, and here are just examples of transcription factors that my lab has studied, combine to relatively open spans of DNA. They're binding to these uh, DNA sequences recruit to the vicinity of these genes many coactivator proteins. I'll just give one example, a histone acetyl transferase that adds acetyl groups to the N-terminal tails of the histones, providing some of the thermodynamic energy, driving these nucleosomes further apart, mediating induction of transcription. These are very complicated processes in simple cells like stem cells, yeast cells. It's been shown that the activation of a gene involves the binding of perhaps 100 or 200 proteins to that gene's regulatory regions. The uh, mechanisms governing repression of a gene are similarly complicated, mediated by hundreds of repressor proteins. Again, I'll just mention one example, HDACs or histone deacetylases, which serve to remove these acetyl groups and uh, repress uh, gene transcription. Increasingly then, my laboratory has been interested in taking an open-ended view of changes in gene expression and chromatin structure that occur in mouse models and postmortem human brain tissue um, in uh, the context of chronic stress in animals or depression in humans. The reason for this is that over the years, my lab, other labs have focused on candidate gene hypotheses. Again, I don't have to convince uh, this audience of the importance of more open-ended studies because I just don't think we know enough about the brain to always guess correctly. So my lab has used RNA sequencing uh, to identify sets of RNAs that are upregulated or downregulated in response to some experimental condition. And if that regulation is mediated transcriptionally, it will be associated with an increase in some chromatin change associated with gene activation, for example, acetylation of histones, or a reduction in a repressive mechanism uh, as shown here. And we define these chromatin changes genome-wide by using a related method called chip sequencing, chromatin immunoprecipitation followed by sequencing. And we also overlay on these data sets chip seq for various transcription factors, 
either as candidate genes or arising from these same data sets. Um, and we think that overlaying these various platforms of analysis is essential because we know that when we restrict our studies to a single platform, the ability to validate genes is limited. There's a high rate of false negative and false positive discovery, but that areas of intersection in these Venn, Venn diagrams identify genes with much greater accuracy uh, and reproducibility. And so we have now been investing in using these uh, high throughput sequencing uh, methods, uh, and I'll do, give you a progress report. So one study was published last year by Rose Baggett, who's now back in McGill. And what she did, as shown in this study, was to perform RNA-seq two days after 10 days of chronic social defeat stress. She analyzed numerous brain areas. I'm just showing four here, nucleus accumbens, medial prefrontal cortex, basolateral amygdala, ventral hippocampus. I'm sh and I'm showing you genes that are upregulated in yellow or downregulated in blue, in resilient versus control animals or susceptible versus control animals. The uh, Venn diagrams at the right show the exact same data, simply comparing the numbers of genes up or down regulated in resilience versus those regulated in susceptibility. And uh, we think that these kind of uh, large data sets can be very instructive in generating hypotheses. So for example, we had initially hypothesized that the main mechanism of resilience is that the animals that are resilient simply fail to show the bad effects of stress exhibited by the susceptible animals. And although there are some examples of that, by and large, that's not the predominant phenomenon. The predominant phenomenon across most brain regions is that the resilient state is the more plastic one. Many more genes are regulated in resilience than in susceptibility, suggesting that resilience is an active process and the animals that succumb to the bad effects of stress succumb because of a failure of that plasticity. And that has uh, dramatically altered the way we approach these uh, questions. Other interesting changes, uh, differences that we have noted and have uh, developed hypotheses based upon are different patterns seen across brain regions. Note that in resilient animals in the nucleus accumbens, resilience is associated with the induction of many, many more genes than those that are suppressed, more yellow than blue, Whereas in the prefrontal cortex, it's the opposite pattern that's seen. We think that reflects the chrominin changes occurring in the resilient state in these two brain regions. I'm not going to talk about that further. Now, because of concerns about um, limitations of animal models, we have increasingly gone to study postmortem human brain tissue. Uh, so uh, we recently completed a study of 100 humans uh, this is work done by Benoit Labonte in my lab. He's now back at Laval University in Quebec. We obtained uh, brain samples from two brain banks, Gustavo Turecki in McGill and Carol Taminga in Dallas. Now, an N of 100 is really small by your standards. Uh, this is, however, the largest study ever done using RNA sequencing on, uh, on the brains of uh, depressed humans. So half depressed, half not depressed, half male, half female, we need to dramatically increase this data set, but it provides a start. Uh, and uh, we analyzed six brain areas from all, each of these brains, three regions of prefrontal cortex, anterior insula, nucleus accumbens, and ventral hippocampus. And what I'm showing you here are genes that are upregulated in yellow, downregulated in blue, in uh, uh, me, uh, area of ventral medial prefrontal cortex, Broadman area 25, and how those same genes are affected across these other brain areas in males and in females. I'm just gonna highlight an interesting sex difference. Notice how the gene changes in uh, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex in depressed males are largely not seen in other brain regions of the same individuals. Whereas in, in depressed women, there's much more concordance across brain regions. And I'll come back to sex differences in a moment. Having these large RNA-seq data sets has enabled us to entertain an additional way to validate animal models. So for decades, a basic scientists like myself would argue that a behavior exhibited by a rodent is similar to a behavior exhibited by a human that's helpful but limited. Uh, these RNA-seq data sets allow molecular validation as well. 
Uh, uh, this slide is simply describing our effort heuristically. This is not meant to be quantitative. We're now comparing gene expression abnormalities across many brain areas seen in depressed humans, male and female, and ask how the extent to which a chronic stress model in a rodent recapitulates those abnormalities. I've mentioned chronic social defeat stress. We've also used two other chronic stress paradigms. One is chronic variable stress, which I'll come back to in a moment, and chronic social isolation. And what we found is that none of these models is any better than the other in recapitulating molecular abnormalities seen in human depression. Each recapitulates a subset and actually a largely non-overlapping subset of those gene expression abnormalities. Perhaps that's expected that uh, for a syndrome as complex and heterogeneous as depression, that each anim chronic stress model in a rodent is capturing or recapitulating the different flavor or feature or subtype of the human syndrome. Okay, so for the rest of my talk today, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be telling you two stories that are works in progress uh, that have utilized these data sets. One focusing on sex differences and one focusing on mechanisms by which early life experience controls lifelong susceptibility or resilience to stress. So first, sex differences. We know that depression is two to three fold more common in women than men. And there are sex differences reported in clinical features of uh, depression, but the molecular mechanisms underlying those sex differences have remained poorly understood. So we first used the human data sets that I've already showed you to explore sex differences. This is now looking at two brain regions, ventral medial prefrontal cortex and nucleus accumbens, gene expression changes seen in depressed men versus normal men, uh, and how those same genes are affected in depressed women versus normal women, and the converse. The Venn diagram show the number of genes that are affected in depressed men versus depressed women, and you can see a dramatic sex difference in the genes affected. Very little overlap, five to 10% overlap uh, in these gene expression abnormalities. We went through extensive bioinformatic processes to confirm that this is not an artifact or reflection of baseline sex differences, but actual sex differences in depression-induced gene expression abnormalities. However, again, to better validate that, we went in reverse translation to look at an animal model. Uh, oh, first, let me just say that this lack of overlap between gene expression abnormalities and depressed men and women were seen across all six brain region studies. So we turned to an animal model called chronic variable stress because we have found that this model recapitulates the increased susceptibility of females to chronic stress. This is work done by Georgia Hodis and Scott Russo's lab here at Mount Sinai with Benoit, Benoit Labonte. What I'm showing you here are four behavioral outcomes, there are others, uh, to male and female, when male and female mice are exposed to different stresses every day for either six days or 21 days. What you can see is after six days of stress, the females show maximal behavioral abnormalities in each of these assays, whereas the males are normal. But after 21 days, the two sexes now show uh, equivalent uh, behavioral abnormalities. So this seemed like an ideal uh, animal model to study sex differences. And what Benoit did after doing RNA sequencing on several brain regions is again showing a relative lack of overlap between chronic stress-induced uh, changes in gene expression across the brain in female mice versus male mice. The overlap is greater in the mice than in the humans. This is about 10 or 20% overlap. But again, let me just emphasize, these are genetically identical C57 mice exposed to identical stresses. At the end of that 21 days of uh, stress, the animals exhibit identical uh, behavioral abnormalities, and yet the gene expression abnormalities seen in their brains overlap by only 10 or 20 percent. So we believe these data validate our human findings, suggesting that depression may be a fundamentally different syndrome in females than in males, and it really argues for uh, looking at that uh, not only uh, genomically, but also in terms of development of uh, more effective treatments. Up until this point, all the gene expression analyses that I've shown you are based on differential gene expression uh, studies. 
uh, is gene X expressed at a different level in a stressed or depressed brain versus a control brain. But the size of the data sets we have enable more complex bioinformatic analyses. And I'll just give you an example of one that we're using, which is called Weighted Gene Co-Expression Network Analysis. And I want to particularly acknowledge Bin Zhang here at Mount Sinai and Eric Shad and others who've provided this type of bioinformatics expertise. Uh, what uh, WGCNA allows is us to look genome-wide at the association of each gene or each RNA that's expressed with every other RNA that's expressed. And uh, taking that genome, the expressed genome, and dividing it up into gene modules. Uh, one way to depict it is in the circos plot where each slice of the pie is a different gene module. Each module contains a group of genes uh, that are correlated with one another in our data sets, having nothing to do with the known biology of the genes. Um, uh, the most significant uh, module is the one at 12 o'clock, becoming less significant and one, one goes counterclockwise. Each gene can only be in one module. One can then dig into these modules further and ask what types of genes are enriched. So for example, in this top right module, genes are enriched in uh, synaptic transmission, that's encouraging. In the second most module, uh, most highly ranked module is enriched in MAP kinase signaling. Now these concentric circles within the circles plot are displaying whether the genes within each module are also differentially expressed uh, in different regions of female brain or different regions of male brain after uh, in, in the depression uh, state. You can see that this top rank module is associated with many changes in gene expression, roughly equally in men and women. But notice the sex dimorphism exhibited by this second module. Far more gene expression abnormalities in depressed females than in depressed males. So we decided to dig into that module. This is displaying the hub genes in that module. Again, hub genes are those genes that are more tightly regulated with other genes in the module based solely on our uh, data sets having nothing to do with the known biology of these genes. Uh, the uh, concentric, the uh, slices of pi uh, in these, in this diagram is simply telling us whether the gene de depicted is also differentially expressed uh, in the human brain, in this case the female brain, uh, and the concentric circle uh, blue or green is telling us whether the gene is also differentially expressed in our mouse models. And the top ranked gene is a gene called DUSP6 in this module. Uh, and DUSP6 encodes a MAP kinase phosphatase, the strongest hub gene in the strongest module linked to sexual dimorphism, so we decided to study this further. The first step is to validate regulation of DUSP6 in an independent uh, cohort of uh, humans. What we found in our RNA-C cohort is that in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex of depressed human females, DUSP6 is downregulated. We, we validated that in a second cohort and again uh, validated a lack of effect in depressed males. Uh, we also validated uh, the uh, sex-specific downregulation of DUSP6 by chronic variable stress in female mice with no effect seen in control mice. I mentioned that DUSP6 is a MAP kinase phosphatase. The most important MAP kinase in brain is an enzyme called ERK. It's a type of protein kinase, and a reduction in the MAP kinase phosphatase would be predicted to result in an increase in levels of phosphorylated ERK. So uh, Benoit looked at that directly, both in mouse and human, and what he found is, as predicted, uh, in the depressed state in, uh, in humans, there is a selective increase in phospho ERK levels in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex in females, an effect not seen in males, with this, uh, with this phenomenon recapitulated in our chronic stress paradigm in mice. Using immunohistochemistry in human and in mouse prefrontal cortex, we were able to show that DUSP6 is highly enriched in uh, pyramidal neurons throughout the thickness of the uh, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, and that uh, the downregulation of DUSP6 and the induction of phospho uh, is enriched in these pyramidal neurons in the depressed state. 
Now, all of the bioinformatics that I've shown you are correlations and deductions. And we think that it is absolutely essential to provide experimental, empirical validation of these bioinformatic deductions. So what Benoit did was to design a microRNA, incorporated it within a viral vector that knocked down DUSP6 expression in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex of female mice. We then dissected out the tissue that is showing this reduction in DUSP6 and did RNA-seq on that tissue. And what we did was to compare the cha changes in gene expression that are induced in the female uh, ventral medial prefrontal uh, cortex by DUSP6 downregulation with the abnormalities in gene expression induced in the same brain region by chronic variable stress. We used a bioinformatic tool called rank-rank hypergeometric overlap, which simply provides a threshold-free way to compare two large data sets. And you can see that there is highly significant overlap, meaning validating our bioinformatic prediction that knockdown of DUSP6 really does serve a hub gene function and recapitulates many of the gene expression abnormalities induced in this brain region by chronic stress. When we isolate the genes that display that overlap, we can show that the module in which we identify DUSP6 in humans is highly overrepresented in these co-regulated genes. Uh, blue shows downregulation, yellow upregulation. First, uh, this finding uh, validates the viral-mediated knockdown of DUSP6 and the consequent regulation of most genes in this module validating DUSP6 as a hub gene. We next turn to using this viral tool to directly test whether the reduction in DUSP6 expression levels in ventral medial prefrontal cortex controls depression-related behavior. Uh, this experiment is shown in this slide. Uh, in this experiment, we used a briefer period of chronic variable stress, which we term sub-threshold chronic variable stress, which does not produce behavioral abnormalities in either female mice or in male mice. However, when we inject our viral vector expressing the microRNA that knocks down DUSP6 in mouse ventral medial prefrontal cortex, we show that that is enough to increase the susceptibility of female mice to this subthreshold uh, stress. Now, the female mice show um, uh, behavioral abnormalities induced by this brief period of stress. And notice how males do not show that increase in stress susceptibility, even though we can show that the microRNA works equally well in knocking down DUSP6 levels in both sexes. Uh, Benoit did the opposite experiment, which we think is very important for possible therapeutic applications of these findings. We used a different virus that overexpresses wild-type DUSP6 within this brain region, now in the context of the full course of chronic variable stress, which produces behavioral abnormalities in normal male and female mice. We can show an antidepressant or pro-resilient effect of overexpressing DUSP6 in the female animals with no behavioral activity in the male animals. So a sex-specific antidepressant-like pro-resilient action of manipulating DUSP6 in females. Again, despite the fact that we, we show equivalent levels of overexpressing the DUSP6 protein in the two sexes. To gain some initial insight into how it is that these sex-specific effects uh, are being mediated, we collaborated with Yan Dong and his colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh, where, they, where uh, we overexpressed uh, this uh, uh, the uh, virus that expressing the microRNA that knocks down DUSP6 in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Uh, the uh, Dong lab cut brain slices through the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and recorded from pyramidal neurons. And what they found was an increase in excitability induced by DUSP6 knockdown in, in neurons from female mice, no effect in male mice. So this is setting up a very interesting uh, hypothesis that regulation of DUSP6 can cause a sex-specific change in these pyramidal neurons 
uh, in uh, female ventral medial prefrontal cortex, but not in males, and we're very interested in studying uh, how that occurs. Uh, this is uh, uh, a summary slide of where we are with this project at the current time. Uh, very interested in understanding the basis of these sex differences, whether it's hormonal or chromosomal. We need to look at that uh, more uh, directly. Many people ask, and we've asked ourselves, if the gene expression abnormalities induced by chronic stress or seen in depression are so different between men and women, why then is it that uh, the same antidepressant drugs work roughly equally well in both sexes? And that's because of several things. One is, first of all, some of the same genes are affected, even though the overlap is only five or 10%, that's still hundreds of genes. Many of the genes that have been previously implicated uh, in stress models in rodents, validated in depressed humans, are actually seen in both sexes. I don't think that's surprising because the earlier studies didn't look for sex differences, so we found the most robustly, commonly regulated species. The second phenomenon is that even those different genes are re regulated, in many cases, some of the genes constitute the same molecular pathways. So some of the same molecular pathways are altered in depressed women and depressed men, even though different specific genes uh, contribute to that aberrant regulation. Despite that, however, clearly, as I've shown you, there are examples where there are sex-specific mechanisms uh, of depression and of antidepressant-like effects. DUSB6 is just one example. We have several others. Uh, and we think that this argues very strongly for the need for uh, drug discovery efforts to proceed by taking sex specificity into account. For the next uh, 10 or so minutes, I'm gonna tell you about another project in my lab, which is understanding how it is that an experience early in life can alter an individual's behavior for a lifetime. We know that one of the greatest risk factors for depression is exposure to early life trauma. So Kate Pena uh, in my lab uh, sought to design an animal model based on maternal separation in mice that would not alter adult behavior in animals, but yet render those animals more susceptible to subsequent stress. And that paradigm is illustrated here. Kate studied early life stress in the first half of the pre-weaning period or in the second half of the pre-weaning period. She then rehoused the animals normally, and when the animals were adults, subjected them to um, a subsequent stress. Uh, and what she found is that only the early life stress, maternal separation in the second half of the pre-weaning period, leads to normal behavior in adulthood, but increased stress susceptibility, a latent increase in stress susceptibility. That's shown in the bottom figures. For male mice, that early life stress one does not cause an enhancement in uh, social avoidance uh, or the percent of resilient and susceptible mice. Um, however, exposure to early life stress in the second weaning period increases susceptibility rather dramatically. This is also seen in other behavioral endpoints, for example, sucrose preference, and female offspring show the exact same behavioral response. So by now, my lab uh, approaches this question uh, by uh, spinal reflex almost, using uh, RNA sequencing across as many brain regions as possible uh, to develop hypotheses of what molecular mechanisms might mediate these phenomena. And what Kate, noted, Kate noticed in comparing these uh, RNA-seq data sets was a dramatic similarity between the lasting effects of early life stress with animals analyzed in adulthood with the effects of social defeat or subsequent chronic stress in adult animals. So the top heat map in each case shows those genes that are up or down regulated in an adult mouse that had been exposed to early life stress two months earlier. So these are lifelong changes in gene expression and notice how a large subset of these genes show similar regulation in an animal that's been normally reared, but then subjected to chronic stress as an adult. 
This was most apparent in the male ventral tegmental area, although similar patterns were seen in the other brain areas and other sexes. And uniquely in the male VTA, uh, we were able to implicate one particular transcription factor as being crucial in uh, mediating that similar regulation, a protein called OTX2. We demonstrated this again using RRHO, simply highlighting statistically the common transcriptional targets induced by early life stress and that induced by adult stress in other mice taking these genes that show that overlap, implicating OTX2 as the top rank upstream regulator. So we decided to study OTX2 in greater detail. What I'm showing you in the upper right hand of the slide now are six examples of the target genes that predicted uh, uh, OTX2 as an upstream target. Notice how the RNA-seq data showed suppression of each of these target genes. Interestingly, OTX2 itself was not altered in these RNA-seq data sets. That was really curious. That prompted Kate to look earlier in development. And what she found, in fact, was that there was a transient reduction in OTX2 mRNA expression levels within the VTA of male mice subjected to this uh, early life stress period. But those OTX2 levels returned to normal rather rapidly uh, during development. So that by adulthood, as seen in our RNA-seq data set, OTX2 levels were back to normal. This is at the mRNA level. Kate also used immunohistochemistry to test whether OTX2 protein showed similar patterns of regulation. First, she was able to demonstrate that virtually all OTX2 in the VTA is present within dopaminergic neurons, showing co-expression of OTX2 in the nucleus of tyrosine hydroxylase positive neurons within the uh, mouse VTA. She then used this method to show that early on, after early life stress, there is indeed a reduction in OTX2 protein, as seen at the mRNA level, but normal. But this normalizes by adulthood. Uh, Kate first tested causally whether OTX2 mediated the latent stress susceptibility induced by early life stress in this experiment. She subjected the male pups to early life stress stresses before, and then injected a virus expressing OTX2 uh, or GFP as a control into the VTA. Now these HSV vectors are perfect for this paradigm because they only express their transgenes for a few days after injection. So this is an ideal way to overcome the ELS2 induced suppression in OTX2 by transient viral expression of the protein but viral expression uh, wanes within a few days, leaving OTX2 normal for the rest of the animal's life uh, as, as shown uh, in, in the ELS2 paradigm. And what Kate found, and just looking at this summary slide in the middle, was that overexpression of OTX2 right around that uh, period of early life stress was enough to restore normal levels of resilience in these animals. And along with that restoration in resilience was a correction, a rescuing of the impaired gene expression of most of those predicted targets for OTX2, as shown in this slide. Uh, Kate wanted to do the converse experiment, where she now developed a microRNA that uh, mediated a knockdown of OTX2 in the juvenile VTA. The experimental paradigm is shown at the top. In this case, the animals were exposed to no stress at all. So they were injected into the VTA with this virus that knocks down OTX2. Again, these are HSVs. So this knockdown of OTX2 is only transient. It, it uh, rather uh, correctly recapitulates the transient reduction in OTX2 induced by early life stress with OTX2 levels being normal for the rest of the animal's life. And what she was able to show is that this knockdown of OTX2 transiently at this phase of development was sufficient to enhance stress susceptibility, just as we saw with early life stress. And in fact, knocking down OTX2 was enough to cause sufficient to cause a lifelong suppression 
of several, not all, but several of these predicted downstream targets of OTX2 as well. So this is an interesting paradigm where a transient reduction in OTX2, even though OTX2 returns to normal, causes a lifelong change in gene expression and a lifelong change in behavior. And we wanted to gain some understanding of what, what is happening uh, at the individual genes uh, that mediates their lifelong suppression. K turned to quantitative chromin and immunoprecipitation to measure the binding of OTX2 uh, at these putative target genes for the uh, OTX2 uh, early in life or in adulthood. And what she found is that under normal conditions, there is high levels of OTX2 binding to predicted OTX2 binding sites within the regulatory regions of each of these genes that is dramatically depleted uh, after early life stress, early in development when we know OTX2 levels are down. Interestingly, in adulthood, we know that OTX2 levels have become uh, restored, are now normal, and indeed OTX2 binding to these genes becomes normal. Even looks like there, there's an overshoot, although it's not significant, statistically significant, even though these genes remain suppressed. So we are now exploring uh, what it is that is happening at these genes that sustain their suppression, despite the fact that OTX2 levels are restored using a proteomic approach in collaboration with Ian Mays at Mount Sinai and Ben Garcia at Penn. We've looked, genome, uh, we've looked at all histone marks in the VTA after early life stress, identified several marks that uh, show significant regulation, in this case, induction. Uh, this stands for histone 3, lysine 4, monotrimethylation, and so on. We're doing CHIP-seq now for these marks. Here's an example of CHIP-seq for this monomethylation of lysine 4, uh, verifying our proteomic finding by CHIP-seq that there's a genome-wide induction of um, this mark. Um, uh, uh, here's a, an example of a gene that displays that effect. And by comparing the genes that show this induction with our RNA-seq data sets, it looks like an induction of this mark may be associated with a suppression or induction of these genes at baseline and a potentiation of expression of these same genes uh, after early life stress plus adult stress as well. So we're digging into uh, these mechanisms and others uh, to understand what's happening at these target genes to mediate their lifelong suppression. So we think this is a really cool model because it's an example where early life stress causes permanent behavioral change, permanent changes in gene expression, uh, mediated at least in part by a transient change in OTX2. And a key uh, goal now is to know what is the nature of the chromatin scar at these genes maintaining their suppression, even though OTX2 levels uh, return to normal. So with that, uh, let me just conclude. Um, I hope I've convinced you that it is possible to use animal models to um, understand mechanisms of susceptibility and resilience to stress, provide insight into mechanisms of depression. Uh, I focus today on sex differences, uh, lifelong changes in susceptibility by early life experience. We also have large data sets related to antidepressant effects. We do think that chromatin modifications are a very important mechanism underlying these stable behavioral changes mediated by life experiences. And we would love to use these data sets to help us understand uh, human depression better. Uh, with respect to uh, the Psychiatric Genetics Consortium, we would be particularly interested to, to overlay our data sets with uh, human genomic findings and look at ways to uh, bi-translationally uh, use that information. And finally, I want to thank uh, funding sources, uh, particularly the National Institute of Mental Health and a private foundation called the Hope for Depression Research Foundation. So I'll stop there, and if there are any uh, questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Catherine, I think you're I muted. Yeah, uh, hi Eric, I'm back. Uh, thank you for that fantastic talk. I mean, even for people like me that don't work in animal models, I've just learned so much and it was just Thank so you. clear.
Um, for those of you um, listening in, if you look at the top right hand corner of your uh, screen, there is a Q&A tab where, where you can ask and I suspect there will be many of you with burning questions after this, so please do. Um, so does anyone want to kick off the discussion? Um, Tammy, can I ask you how we will know if someone's asking? Like so I'm getting... Um, I see one. Yes. Yeah, so, oh, right. so this is from Tracy. Hi, Tracy. Uh, did the sex differences, ana sex difference analyses factor in estrous phase of females? Do you know if estrous hormones affect? Yeah, so this is obviously a key question and interest of ours. Uh, uh, as you know, and, and uh, many people on the line know, the estrus cycle in uh, mice is extremely short. It's just three or four days. So in our experiments that are carried out over uh, several weeks, uh, the, uh, the several cycles are uh, encompassed. We typically um, synchronize animals at the start of the experiment. By the end of the experiment, that synchrony has often been lost. Uh, so the RNA-seq data on the mice uh, uh, included mice, females, at different estrus phases. Uh, we we would, would need to uh, redo this analysis uh, powered uh, much more strongly to look at different estrus phases. It's something we're very interested in doing. We assume that sex hormones have a, a, a dramatic contribution to some of the effects that we've seen, but we haven't looked at it specifically. Um, ah. So I have um, one question that's come through uh, by, oh, chat. So maybe I'll deal with this one first and then we can go on to Silvana. So this okay. is a question uh, from a clinician from Daniel Muller in Toronto mm -hmm. asking in a sample of depressed patients, what specimens would you collect? to be able to look at these effects to, to be of value. Right, so uh, the studies I talked about today were all studies of post-mortem human brain tissue. Uh, so these are not experiments that we, that we could do on our patients. Uh, I, I think uh, it would be crucial to further build post-mortem collections of brains of control and depressed uh, humans. Uh, so that uh, we have larger and larger samples. As I mentioned, my data set of 100 is one of the largest that's been subjected to RNA-seq. Gosh, we may have to do thousands in order to really achieve a power uh, for uh, uh, genetics. Uh, for living patients, uh, we could obtain blood or uh, skin samples. Uh, one of the concerns is that we know, as I've shown, that the changes that we see in gene expression are so different between one brain region and another, mm. but I think it's unlikely that blood or skin is going to show or recapitulate changes that are seen in brain accurately. On the other hand, as diagnostics, that's not necessary. It's very plausible that changes in the periphery might be reflective of what's going on in the brain. After all, chronic stress affects the entire body. Uh, and so this is an empirical question that would be very interesting to carry out uh, large-scale RNA-seq data sets, to, as some uh, people have done, members of the PGC have done, uh, and, and look at uh, whether they provide some insight into um, uh, what's uh, been observed. So um, can I just ask what, why yeah. skin specifically? Oh, so I mentioned skin just because people have been interested in uh, using it as a way to make induced pluripotent stem cells, oh, okay. induced neurons or other cell types. Um, but I think again for a uh, syndrome that as uh, that does not have that much heritability compared to schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, I think the IPS route would be far more complicated. Uh, it's already complicated enough for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. I think depression would raise that bar uh, still further. Um, I can address these other questions from Silvana. Uh, is there different expression of dust B6 according to the estrous cycle? Yeah, so we have not looked at that yet. Uh, this is a question that we're very interested in. Uh, we should have estrocycle information from the humans 
uh, when they died, at least we're hoping to. Uh, we have blood samples from these humans, and if necessary, we're going to go back and, and try to assess uh, menstrual cycle phase based on uh, blood, uh, and that's a great question. We would, we would like to do that. Uh, at the same time, we're now uh, back to Tracy's question. We're looking in mice, female mice, whether there are baseline fluctuations in dust B6 through the uh, estrous cycle. Uh, Edna's question is, were the postmortem samples also controlled for drug treatments or for suicide? Yes, they were. Um, the, uh, McG the McGill uh, Montreal brain bank is largely a suicide brain bank. Uh, therefore, we were uh, found it, we thought it would be essential to corroborate these findings in a brain bank that did not uh, have a lot of individuals who died by suicide. Uh, in the Dallas brain bank, there were extremely few suicides. When we look at all 100 samples, we looked at um, suicide uh, uh, and drug treatment and so on as uh, possible variables, and, and they were not variables in the gene expression patterns uh, that I found. Uh, that I showed you today. Uh, for drug treatments, all these people were drug-free at the time of death, although there was a lot of variability, as you might expect, in life history of antidepressant exposure, but we did not see that as confounding our data sets with a principal component analysis. Mm. Um and I have one more question that's come through in the webinar chat um, mm -hmm. line, which um, just asks whether you've observed sex differences in treatment response to antidepressants. I'm sorry, can you say that again, Catherine? Uh, so whether you'd observed sex differences in response to antidepressants. We are just analyzing those data yeah. sets now. We do not have that yet, uh, but it, it, the um, we are looking at sex differences in uh, the effects of a standard antidepressant, uh, either mipramine or fluoxetine, for example, and uh, after chronic administration in a stressed rodent versus a, a single dose of ketamine in a stressed mm -hmm. rodent. Uh, look, because we think that it's essential to look at antidepressant effects in rodents in the context of stress. A lot of the literature in rodents, I think, is done in normal rodents, and that's not as telling because we know that antidepressants really don't uh, do much of anything in, hu in normal humans, except side effects. They don't elevate mood in normal humans. Um, and uh, we are eagerly awaiting the data sets to see if there are similar sex differences. Okay. Thank you. So um, given we've got through the ask questions, maybe the last couple of minutes, I could just ask you how we would you know, kick off collaboration between you and your lab and, and the PGC. So as you may know, in the MDD group, we've just performed a, a large GWAS and now have 44 significant findings, which yeah. we're you know, delighted yeah. by. But obviously, this is just the starting point to a whole, you know, a whole slew of downstream um, uh, um, experiments and analyses. So what would be useful to, to you and to fill this gap right. between us? So I think uh, the earlier data that I've seen, uh, I think failed to show a, any dramatic sex difference in those genomic kits, if I'm correct about that, which would be interesting. And it suggests perhaps that the sex differences that we're seeing in brain are epigenetic, somehow mediated uh, outside the genome. Um, and so I think it would be very interesting to uh, complement our RNA-seq data sets in postmortem human brain tissue with ChIP-seq or other ATAC-seq, DNA methylation uh, sequencing and so on. But we would love to overlay the two data sets. Um, and I, I am not a bioinformatics person. I don't know how to do that or how easy it is to do that. Uh, we would have to make sure that we have um, GWAS data on the 100 samples, and that's something that we can do. We can talk to Gustavo and Carol to make sure that that's done. And then we get your help in doing the analyses and see if there is any overlay uh, between the um, expressed um, RNAs and uh, SNP variations. Yeah. Sounds great, and that will be a very interesting starting point. Um, it is now exactly four o'clock, so we'll, I'm sure we'll continue this online. And